All right, now, everybody. Quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people have been with me before. You know it's going to be a tough grind. But we're going to have a show. And hello, my credibility glasses are on, and I need them today for the maximum credibility. What's the problem? We're a bit hot. I'm hot. What? What? The levels are hot. Yeah, yeah you're just, really just loud. Bring it down oh, a little geez. bit. You know what? I I I, I hate the oh, whole no. setup. Oh no! Here he goes. I absolutely <laughs> hate it. I spend 15 minutes trying to get the show on the air, trying yeah. to load some. Oh, Whoever is everyone. producing this thing <laughs> has no idea what, what they're doing. That sounds it's good. All right. Yeah. It's all going to be okay. Deep breaths. I'm, I'm, I'm utterly disgusted. Yeah. I'm mm. utterly disgusted. As Jim Steel said, it's going to be a tough grind, people. I'm dejected. I'm disgusted. I'm despondent. And I'm. Give me another D word. Uh. Despicable? Dumb? Damn <laughs> no, loud, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, guys. I don't know. A lot of why are you yelling? Yeah. Oh my god, guys. I love it when you're angry. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I need a second. Give me a second. Talk among yourselves. Absolutely outrageous. Dumbfounded, says Stan. There you go. Dumbfounded is strong. Thank you, Stan. I've worked so hard on this show today. Went to Madonna last night. The Madonna show was great. It really was great. It didn't end until one. And I got home late. Oh. And I worked last night. Then I worked early this morning. So you're Sent delirious. Tony a bunch of stuff. Yeah. I'm beat. I'm angry. And I love it when you're angry. All right. Yeah. Well, and um, I'm just saying. Madonna yeah. showed up on time for Madonna time. I oh. mean, and I will tell you that again, and just to review, I got uh, some emails saying, oh, Madonna, the show is awful. It's the, this, that, and the next thing. She doesn't show up for an hour and a half. But once you know she's not going to show up for an hour and a half, then right. it's no big deal. I kind of like the, yeah, exactly. Madonna's usually way late, like two hours late. Wow. But, um, we got there, understanding that, hung out for a while, sat next to the voice of Cleveland in the Family Guy spinoff, The Cleveland Show. Oh. That was kind of cool. Now, he's controversial, though, not for anything that disenchanted would have been a good, uh, another good word. I just am seeing that from, um, from Gail. Yeah. Um, the um, disrespectful of the cup, may I don't know. It's very diva like, not a big deal, Karen. I don't, anyway, uh, he's kind of controversial because I think he had to give up the Cleveland role because he's not black and Cleveland oh. is a black character. You'll have to check that, but I think that's Google right. It. I'm pretty sure that's right. It was sort of, you know, he's doing well. Don't sweat him. He's doing very well, this guy. <laughs> but uh, still. Um, the, uh, does Mark ever not sit next to anyone famous, uh, right. is the question. <laughs> no, because Mark sits in the good seats. That's why. There he is. That's right. Mike Henry. Very, very well done. Is that, uh, you know, Tony, if that's you, I want to, after the mm -hmm. fact, yeah, recognize totally. again, mm -hmm. most valuable player yesterday. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks, Tony. During Sam Rubin, we had Sam Rubin on talking about the Oscars. And Sam Rubin literally said, whoever is pulling up all these pictures so quickly, mm -hmm. wow, very impressive. I, I didn't know. I was just close to jumping in going, hey, is KTLA hiring? <laughs> <laughs> like you need another job. job. Come on. Yeah, exactly. You couldn't I, I fit it in anyway. I just want one if that's possible. I, I'm oh. willing to do whatever it takes to have just one job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd like one decent, one solid, decent job. Um, anyway, the um, the Madonna show uh, it, it looks back at her career, you know, 40 years, and so it's done in these sort of chapters of her life. And um, one of the chapters of her life, very relevant to Bay Area viewers and listeners, you know, um, it didn't just affect the Bay Area, but I was in the Bay Area when the AIDS crisis and the scourge of AIDS hit 
And we lost so many friends and colleagues at uh, KRON. At that time, it was NBC. And uh, NBC News was sort of just beginning to cover the story of AIDS. And uh, San Francisco was a much, much different place. And it's so weird how you are brought back to that time. She does a whole chunk in her act. She never mentions AIDS. She doesn't have to mention it. She posts the pictures of all those lost AIDS. It's very moving. But uh, in her 40-year career, you know, you realize, wow, all those decades, all that music, all that change, she was a cultural icon mm -hmm. in the world of pop music. And she changed, and she changed music. And more than anything, what a show. So many visuals, so much choreography. Now, we're going to have Madonna's choreographer in, though, right? Uh, yeah. When is that? Is that this week? Yeah. That is going to be on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. So Thursday, I want to ask him. Now, he does a lot of the Madonna choreography for her music videos. He's d done that. And Michael Jackson, by the way. His but, name is uh, Vincent Patterson. Right. And so I want to ask Vincent about the putting together of a huge show like this. Um, I don't know what's involved, but it, it's so immensely complicated i can only imagine and and i mean pulling it off is immensely complicated it's like i don't know four broadway shows going on at the same time mm -hmm. it just it, it's amazing so anyway all of those intricacies i i really want to visit with uh vincent just to get a sense of it that's all do you feel uh, like she was lip syncing or did you feel like she was live singing i felt like she was probably in and out of it in and okay. out of both I know she wasn't lip syncing the whole thing because I, mm -hmm. I mean, some of the stuff she does, she, she's only on stage and she does it just to, you know, it's acoustic, you know. Right. Um, but yeah, I'm sure she's in and out of it. She's 65 years old and she yeah. was amazing. I mean, getting it, it's what I, it's what I felt about Mick Jagger when I saw him when he was 65. How old is Mick Jagger now? I mean, uh, you, you just go, wow. I mean, there's so much energy. And her stuff is way more performative. I mean, there's way more theater involved. And there are way more thematic elements to a Madonna show than to a Stone show. A Stone show is great songs, up and moving, Mick out there kind of expressing himself in physical ways. But Madonna, there's costumes and changes and... Uh, mm -hmm. As I say, a story, it was really quite great. Mick Jagger, um, by the way, is 80 years old. Wow. I mean, that mm -hmm. is terrific. Yeah. Good for Mick. Um, all right. Anyway, that's enough about the um, Madonna show. There was another reason I wanted to mention it to you, but I... Um... Oh, Andrew, this is so on brand for you. I'm so glad you said this. <laughs> the Stones have talent, Mark. Madonna does not. Andrew, you and I will never be able to carpool together. I, I really feel as though uh, the love is out of our relationship. So. The Mark Thompson Show. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on in Trump land. I will get to it. The Pulitzer Prize winner, David K. Johnston, joins us in the second hour. I will review with David... A couple of things. First of all, I'll review something that was sent to me by a listener viewer. I think it was Lori who sent this petition. There's a petition circulating mm -hmm. to prohibit, essentially, Donald Trump from getting the security briefings and access to uh, more documents, security documents. Uh, anyway, we're going to ask... Um, it's traditional for former presidents to get these briefings. We're going to ask David K. Johnston about that. But on the money, David K. Johnston has been so spot on. And one of the things he's been spot on about is how compromised Trump is as a result of his need for money. So he comes up with almost $100 million to pay the first bond. He needs to come up with, by some calculations, another $500 million. How do you come up with that money? Donors. And exactly. And so when you, donors is the most illegitimate way to come up with it, meaning it's not coming out of your coffers, but hey, wherever it comes from. But those donors, and the reason I say 
most legitimate, illegitimate way to come up with it is those donors expect something mm -hmm. for that money. That's the problem with our system. When a lot of money is fed into it, that money expects something back for being fed into it. No one donates money on that level without expecting a return. But in the case, those, that's the 91 million. In the case of the, again, by some calculations, another 500 million, it could even be north of that figure, but, and I've seen 600 million. Uh, what about that money? Where does that come from? That's not a single donor and it's not even a collection of donors. It is suggested that Trump may get it from outside sources, maybe even foreign sources. Does that further compromise a future president, is the thought, or a presidential candidate in this case, mm -hmm. who now is beholden to those forces and entities that produce that funding? It's a really provocative notion. And, you know, one of the things they do with these background checks is they check to see if a candidate or anybody who's trying to get security clearance, they check to see if they're in debt. They look at banking because it's viewed as a security compromise. If you're too much in debt, you could be compromised for national security documents or information that would then be in exchange for finances. Yep. So, Did uh, you see this? Yeah. I just saw this, and I don't know if you I had seen it earlier, but there is a Republican group planning to spend, speaking of money, $50 million on a campaign to block Trump from re-election. Now, these are Republicans that are trying to do this, and they're going to sp spend a lot of money on ads trying to appeal to moderate Republicans to block him. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of the Lincoln project mm -hmm. uh, of the GOP. I, I, I don't know that any ad campaign or messaging campaign is going to punch through the immutable hold that Donald Trump has on a portion of the electorate. And, you know, this revisionist way they look at his presidency. I mean, they don't see the clear. There's always been okay. in this country no. 30 to 35 percent yeah. idiots. <laughs> All right. And those super MAGA people will never move. But it is that independent crew that there might be some wiggle room with. Mm -hmm. But that really is interesting that, you know, within his own party, yep. there might be some real pushback on Trump. The other thing I would just mention is, and we've got it, I think, uh, sort of as a headline, is um, what's happening with Trump and the... Um, the Mark Thompson Show. Trump and the RNC. Um, I believe uh, he really just moved in and uh, cleaned house. This is sort of a window into how things might work in a second Trump administration. You know, there was the head of White House personnel was there really just to establish who was the loyalist and who might not be as loyal to Trump. And that's how you kept your job there. The simple answer is no, you cannot freeze a potato, says Buck. Uh, thank you, Buck, for that. And uh, <laughs> for that $5 uh, super chat, I uh, give you a big shout out. Big shout out. Um, the MAGA movement blows into RNC land. And they really are the MAGA movement. They are the Republican Party. Uh, there was a piece from Jonah Goldberg today, and he essentially says just that. Donald Trump's domination of last week's primaries made it official. He successfully routed the GOP establishment. Some would argue with ample evidence that this happened a long time ago, particularly in Congress. The party's divided into three sometimes overlapping factions, Reaganites, pragmatists, and populists, the last being Trump's MAGA faction. And politicians from the first two groups have been retreating, retiring, or reinventing themselves in Trump's image for years now. And I mean, a great example of this is Marco Rubio, you know, look at him now. He's singing like only from the MAGA hymnal. And there's Mike Lee of Utah and Ron Johnson with Wisconsin and Tim Scott from South Carolina who wants to be vice president. And you end up with the Paul Ryans of the world, the Eric Cantors and Liz Cheney's being shown the door. 
Uh, he says that process has accelerated since Trump effectively locked up the Republican nomination for president for the third time. Over the past few months, non-MAGA Republicans like Mike Gallagher of Wisconsin or Patrick McHenry of North Carolina or Kathy McMorris Rogers of Washington have announced that they will be leaving Congress. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, the last actual avatar of the, quote, GOP establishment, declared that he would not run to lead the Republican caucus again before going on to then endorse Trump. So he goes on and on, but you really see how it's a Trump world if you're a Republican. Uh, Now, that's why I look at what Kim was saying about that pushback within the party Mm -hmm. with some interest, you know. Um, well, they say they're going to spend that money in um, in swing states and they're going to blanket it with TV ads and billboards and digital media and full force. Mm. Um, well, Trump is the Republican establishment now. And so now they've moved into the RNC. You know about all the replacements there. They've essentially uh, replaced all of the existing RNC personnel with... Uh, uh, many have just been fired, and they'll slowly be repopulating it with Trump loyalists. And, is of that, course, his daughter-in-law will run it. Is that normal? Usually do presidents or former presidents have much sway over what happens at their in their party uh, leadership? Uh, they do, but uh, on some level. But usually they're the result of an institutional push. This is a very interesting moment in American politics because— And we'll talk to Michael Shore about this and others, you know, in our meetup, uh, what is it, Thursday, we can ask Jim Avila too. But, um, and I'll, we'll obviously pass along whatever we find out. But I I would say that traditionally, there is more cooperation between the lead candidate and the institution that is the party they represent. So that's why we, uh, we, I'm frustrated by the institutional nature of politics on the Democratic side. I don't really care about the Republican side. I mean, you see the same thing. They quack similarly from the standpoint of the institution that brings a candidate forward. In this case, in Trump world, you have the candidate essentially dictating on down the way what personnel changes there will be and really how the party will quack. Mm -hmm. And that is what's happening. More than 60 people were fired. They got rid of senior staff in the political data and communications departments. They also included local staff These are people who run community centers in African-American, Asian, and Hispanic communities, you know, for Republican outreach into some of those communities. So what's happening, and, you know, Ronald McDaniel was bumped, right? And Laura Trump, who is um, the daughter-in-law of Donald Trump, was elected the co-chair. Yep. I, I think what you have here is just an extension of... Trump loyalty leading the way, and they want no part of anyone who isn't very much in the Trump world. In a speech accepting the position, Michael Watley, who is a close ally of Donald Trump, uh, said this, the RNC would work hand in glove with the Trump campaign. The new COO of the RNC, Chris LaCivita, continuing in his Trump campaign senior advisor role as well. So you can see it all comes together. MAGA is now in control of the Republican Party. And that's what Marjorie Taylor Greene said. There it is. MAGA is now in control of the Republican Party. So that's the update on that. But it just it's worth noting this date. This is uh, old gar out. New guard in. The Mark Thompson Show. And there have been some real policy changes already as a result of Trump getting money. He changed, I mean, reversed his field completely on TikTok. And it's thought that reversal comes after a big meeting with a mega donor who didn't want the ban on TikTok. This is how you get something for your money. So I'll talk to David K. Johnson about that. But again, 
Uh, mega donor says, hey, I've got a stake in TikTok. Can't see anything happen to TikTok. And Trump goes, hey, what's going to happen to TikTok? I'm not going to touch TikTok. <laughs> Completely forgetting that he had said he'd ban them. Uh, word from the Oscars. I love this. The Mark Thompson Show. Jimmy Kimmel almost didn't read that tweet at the end. The his, tweet involving Donald Trump. His wife didn't want him to do it. And his wife is the executive producer of the show. Molly McNerney. She said, um, I tried to talk Jimmy out of reading it. I feel like my instincts are usually right, but I was totally off on this one. She said she wasn't in favor of giving Trump any airtime if she didn't have to. She also said, I thought the joke was a risk. And there's always, the, and, and you're going to leave the audience, remember, with that joke. She says, quote, I just wanted to make sure it ended well, and I didn't want it to end on a sour note. Kimmel assured his wife everything would be fine. Quote, he had a glimmer in his eye, and he said, I got this. He yeah. really did. This is where he shines, she said. Yeah. The joke, of course, was a hit. And she says, I will tell you, I'm never going to win an argument in my household again. <laughs> <laughs> but great stuff on the Oscars. I thought Jimmy was brilliant. And, of course, the Oscar ratings were up which is extraordinary these days yeah. right kim is the i think they were up four percent yeah they were um they were up i guess the most people since 2020 which is wow. four years but it's pretty good right yeah look at you jimmy very very cool um it's a other hard thing job. What's, it's a it's a really oh. hard job because you want people to laugh, but then you don't want to be offensive, and you don't want to, you like there's a line you can't cross, but just kind of stick a toe a little bit over it. It's hard. Exactly. No, I think that's exactly right. It's a lot like uh, doing uh, doing this program. If I can what? Say. Yeah, it Indeed. really is. Man. Indeed. Yeah. Sometimes you come on, it's too loud. There's no way. You got to load this, load that, take that level down, that level up. Oh my God, the levels are uneven. You got it. You got the idea. The Mark Thompson uh, Show. All right. Um, it is also a day where we'll have stories from the sky and big news out of Boeing. I'll have that story with a special guest. We've never before had a guest for stories in the sky. This guy was one of the top, I think, top three at EasyJet, which is sort of the Southwest Airlines of Europe, and was. Critical. I think he was the guy who opened Great Britain to Easy Jet. So I'm looking forward to having him. I'm going to get his reaction to what's going on at Boeing and to where the airline industry now is sort of in this place where we used to have a confidence in the hardware and now there's, I think, a little less confidence to be had. But um, he'll be joining us. When is that, Kim? That's I believe. That's twelve thirty. Yeah, in the in the second hour, uh, second half of the second hour. Yes. Um, Tony, I feel as though I, there are two things on deck: law and disorder and bowling with Biden. I know we've done a lot of Trump up front, and I'll go back to Trump with David K. Johnston, but I do want to get to Biden. I also want to get to law and disorder. Now, what would you like to do? Uh, and Kim, you can throw in on this as well, mm -hmm. since I feel like you're a producer as well on this show yeah uh so i uh, this is what i get i ask kim how are you uh and i i don't know uh oh, wait, Thanks, what, what am i what are my choices i thought oh, there was exactly. more to come yeah uh oh well we have your news coming up oh yeah we have that but we also have bowling with biden which i'd like to squeeze i could squeeze in bowling with biden before your news for sure right. and then law and disorder i also have now i mean mm. how does the lighting look is it better Yes. No. What do you think, Tony? You're, you're. Uh, Kim always thinks everything's okay. It's not. I think it looks good. It hasn't changed, and it looks this. It, All right. And you're just as bad I, as Kim is. Thanks, Tony. I, I don't. We got, I, you know. we got the emergency lights in the background. They're purple. Kim, how are so you? Oh, we are. God on forbid we say it looks bad. There's going to be more yelling and histrionics and carrying on. God, histrionics is a dang word. I don't know. <laughs> it's a very tough day. Also starts with an H. Oh, you were looking for D words. My bad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. You ready with Bollywood Biden? Yeah. All right. This is Bowling with Biden. Live from White House Lanes, 
It's bowling with Biden. It's go time. This man's going to win a lot of political offices. Now, here's your bowling with Biden host, Mark Thompson. Show for the uh, thank you. That's what I was waiting for. Um, President Joe Biden's budget proposal for 2025 has a $4.7 billion emergency fund for border security. Mm. This is to enable the Department of Homeland Security to ramp up operations should there be a migrant surge. This is a contingency fund. It would still let DHS move on as needed, but they could tap into these funds if required. And with the number of undocumented migrants crossing the southern border after a certain threshold, they would be enabled to, essentially DHS would, and be enabled to dip into that. If the money's not used to address the surge, the money would be transferred to the general funds of Custom and Border Protection. This is, as you know, as the Republicans who have already refused to fund that $13.6 billion amount that was earmarked by the Biden administration in an emergency supplemental request that was supposed to respond to a record high number of migrants crossing the border, um, uh, this uh, this will likely get pushed aside by Republicans because they've already pushed aside, as I've mentioned, that uh, over $13 billion request for emergency supplemental funding. But ICE is going to have to start cutting in key operations by May if Congress does not cover a $500 million budget gap there. So you're already seeing cutbacks in these areas. And you know this, I hate to say it, but all roads tend to lead to Donald Trump with the Republicans. And here, Donald Trump said, I don't want a deal on the border. I don't want him to get help on the border. The border is a powerful message for us and a way for us to win in November. And that's exactly what's happened. The Republicans fell in line. Well, you can't lay the blame at the feet of the current president if you're the one who's preventing it from moving forward and from for problems to be solved here. You can't if facts are something that American people focus on, but oftentimes they just get the message, right? Look at the blowback that the GOP response to the State of the Union, which was filled with these completely concocted facts, that story which bore no relationship to Biden history, and yet it was woven together to suggest that this woman had been this victim of human trafficking during the Biden administration. Look at how even as she's walked that back or waffled or whatever, that's getting... I would suggest less media oxygen in the right wing media media ecosphere than you're seeing in the left or even mainstream media. So I'm saying uh, if people look at, well, that bipartisan bill was pushed back by the GOP, great, then then you're right. It will land with them. And they'll be frustrated by with GOP intransigence on this. Intransigence is a thing. But what you will not see often is that message getting through with those facts. You'll get that response, the GOP response the other night. They're banging the border. The border's a problem. Biggest border surge in history. Whatever they say, these are absolutely concocted facts. And yet they'll live because of, again, I suggest the media disinformation machine that's out there. It's so now well siloed through Twitter slash X, through TikTok, through all the different means and platforms, really. Even on this platform here, YouTube, you know, they'll never see even this show because they're siloed in their own shows. And if they do see this show, they're the Andrew Peters of the world. They just want to go, yeah, Mega 2024, man. So... With apologies to Andrew. Um, <laughs> Hi, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, Biden's budget also asking Congress for $405 million to hire 1,300 more Border Patrol agents. They want funding to keep ICE's 34,000 existing detention beds. A billion dollars for aid to Central America to address the root causes of migration. Nearly a billion to address the backlog of over 2.4 million 
pending cases in U.S. immigrant courts. So these are real asks, and I'd suggest, in fairness, they're real responses with dollars and cents put on all of these issues, and yet this budget will just get kicked out. They asked for funding to hire an additional 1,000 officers to stop the illicit drug trade, the fentanyl trade, the smuggling trade across the U.S.-Mexico border, and $849 million to detect fentanyl at the border. That's for technology that's designed to do that. So, again, the president's budget, it suggested in combination with the Senate's bipartisan border security legislation, this is a quote from... Alejandro Mayorkas, who's the Homeland Security Secretary, he says it's vital to meet the needs of our workforce and the challenges we face. But again, it's uh, likely to get uh, less than a warm reception from the GOP. That's Bowling with Biden. That's all for this edition. There's your new leader. But join us again next time for Bowling with Biden. I have news for you. I really do. In law and disorder, some big news to come. And news related to California and the world of guns. David K. Johnson, the Pulitzer Prize winner in the second hour, along with the number three guy at EasyJet, the guy who got EasyJet going, formerly number three guy at EasyJet. A fascinating guy, actually. But we'll visit with him and get his Thoughts on the state of the aviation industry in Stories from the Sky. Smash the like button like a boss. This has become a more controversial drop. Smash it with your iron rod is uh, getting some blowback in the email. I don't like smash it with my own is is what I'm hearing Mm -hmm. from certain people, but it does uh, sadly find its way into the show regularly. I also want to recognize some special PayPal people and contributors. Maybe I'll do that after Kim's news. PayPal and Patreon is how we stay on the air. We're really kind of like a public radio or public television model. And so many of you have, um, well, you've risen to that challenge and you support us every month and we really appreciate that. There are clicks to PayPal and there's a click through to Patreon underneath this video and underneath uh, most of our videos. You can find click throughs to Patreon or PayPal. We do have a website it can be a little janky trying to get through to it sometimes, but it's the MarkThompsonShow.com, and there are hot links to Patreon or PayPal there. So uh, is that everything, Tony? I believe it is. All right. Oh, there it is. Tony uh, Tony's showing you what the website looks like if you can get through to it. Yeah. Kim, how are you? Oh, very good. I don't have any problems. Just, just right. saying. No, it's not very janky. Well, it's janky. Uh, I can't get through to it because of my uh, ISP, and... Uh, um, We'll look into it. Uh, one of our big contributors couldn't get through to it either, so I wouldn't oh. mention it. Yeah, what because they have their security uh, settings in a rigid state. All right. Well, I mean, yeah. listen, uh, don't throw it back on them, Kim. Please, we need I those will. people. Oh yes, I all will. Right. Um, Kim's news: Jefferson Graham stops through. I have a problem that arose at the Madonna concert that Jefferson Graham's going to help me with, and he also will talk a little bit about some other major issues that are tech related. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. On the Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister, and this report sponsored by CoachellaValleyCoffee.com. It's happening. Republicans, lawmakers are questioning former special counsel Robert Herr about his investigation into President Biden's handling of classified documents. Members of both parties grilling her over his decision not to charge Biden because of his age and poor memory, as according to uh, what her said, her defending his report as being based on facts and strictly non-political is what he says. It's a big day at the polls in Georgia, Hawaii, Mississippi, and Washington. Uh, Folks in those states will be headed to the polls and casting ballots today in presidential nominating contest. This comes as both President Biden and former President Trump are the favorites to win their party's nominations. Trump expected to clinch the nomination when the voting is done, while Biden is expected to do that potentially next week. This is sudden and uh, something that just happened. Yeah, 
it looks like Colorado Republican Ken Buck will be leaving Congress before the end of his term. Buck announcing on X today that he will leave Congress at the end of next week, trimming Republicans' already thin majority. Buck had previously announced that he wouldn't be seeking re-election next year. Now he's leaving, basically now. The congressman had become known for breaking from his party on a number of issues, and that includes his party's election denialism and some of his colleagues' refusal to condemn the Capitol riot. They don't like that. Don't break from them. Nope. As you mentioned earlier, if you break that, if you are, don't go with the, the flow and the Trump flow, you're out. So, Sayonara, sucker! Exactly. So Ken Buck, not only not seeking re-election, out at the end of next week. Wow. Be- Good day, sir! Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, House Democrats are launching an effort to vote on Ukraine aid. Uh, That is an attempt to force the legislation on the floor, despite objection from Republicans who currently control the chamber. The Democrats' discharge petition would require 218 signatures to force the House to consider a Senate-passed foreign aid package that provides $95 billion not only to Ukraine, but also for Israel as well, a Taiwan and humanitarian aid in Gaza. Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson has refused to consider it so far, saying it lacks efforts to strengthen security at the U.S. southern border. Intelligence officials will be briefing lawmakers on the security uh, risks posed today by TikTok. The uh, briefing comes ahead of a highly anticipated floor vote on Wednesday that could ultimately ban this popular social media app in the United States. Lawmakers are concerned the app gives the Chinese government sweeping access to American user data. Data. The Supreme Court is extending a temporary pause on Texas's controversial immigration law. The law allows state law enforcement to arrest and detain people suspected of entering the country illegally. It was set to go into effect Wednesday, the high court, though, extending the pause to review challenges to this law. So uh, it will not go into effect quite yet. And I'm sure that makes a lot of people unhappy. Yes. Speak- Yes, indeed. Speaking of Texas, well, there is a Texas father who is celebrating today. There's a picture of Texas. Y'all can go to hell. I'm going Uh, back to Texas. Yeah, Mm -hmm. baby. Long necks and long horns. No place but Texas. Y'all can all go to hell, and I'm going back to Texas. Right on, man. A federal appeals court siding with this Texas father who does not want his daughters to be able to access birth control. It is a blow to a federal grant program created in the 1970s, providing comprehensive, confidential family planning services. The ruling says it does not override Texas's parental consent law. And so the dad is in charge, right? Wow. Enjoy your grandchildren. (laughs) Meanwhile, the fight over a controversial education law in Florida is coming to an end. The state reached a settlement this week in the lawsuit over the parental education law, the parental rights and education law, I should say. That's the one that's called the Don't Say Gay Bill. Right. The, I, whenever it, it had way too many positive yeah. things associated with it, you knew yeah. it was a nasty law. Uh, the measure passed in 2022. It restricted discussions on gender identity and sexual orientation through third grade. The agreement clarifies the legislation, saying it only restricts these topics in an instructional setting. No, this does not include to references uh, references to the LGBTQ plus community or class participation. So as long as you're not teaching it, you can talk about it. The State Department of Education is expected to send out a memo to all school districts as part of this legal deal. Mm. Inflation is not cooling as quickly as economists predicted. February's Consumer Price Index, a measure of the cost of goods and services, was up 0.4% for the month and 3.2% from the same time last year. Inflation is down from its 2022 peak, but it's still over the Federal Reserve's two-point target. Some new details being released after a young boy was found locked inside of a Columbus area Target store. Police say a 12-year-old boy was found by an employee Monday morning as they opened the store on East Broad Street. Police say the boy's parents had filed a missing persons report on Sunday, an investigation into how this boy went undetected during the store's uh, closing is ongoing. So his parents say he's missing. I guess no one checks the Target. 
I don't know how he got into the Target. Yeah, well, it's also, you yeah, you got security cameras and a whole bunch of stuff at Target. And, I, and you wonder, did the kid, you know, we used to hide from my parents all the time when we went into stores. Yeah. We, not for a long time. I mean, we, no. we weren't, the idea was to leave with mom and dad, but. Um, did you ever hide in the, remember the round clothing racks? You could get oh, right hide in the middle inside of them. them. Yeah, you yeah, could hide yeah. in the middle of them. Yes, mm -hmm. of course. That's yeah, a brilliant that hiding too. place. Sure. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful place. Did anybody situation. check the, the racks for the kid? <laughs> I don't Just know. Saying. Yeah. Retired Major League Baseball star Daryl Strawberry, who turned 62 today, is recovering from a heart attack. The former Mets and Yankees player took to his social media posting a picture of himself at St. Joseph's Hospital West in Missouri, where he thanked the medical staff there, saying a stent procedure totally restored his heart, and now all is well. The Mets legend also thanked his fans for all their prayers. Strawberry helped lead the New York Mets to a World Series championship in 1986, and then the New York Yankees to two World Series championships in 96 and 99. The yeah. Mets are retiring Strawberry's number in June. So hopefully he's, uh, he's doing okay. This report is sponsored by CoachellaValleyCoffee.com. Mmm, it's really the good stuff. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how delicious the tea is. I've been drinking for the last couple of days the vanilla iced tea. And we know Mark's got a full of uh, es is it the espresso, the Ocotillo espresso. Ocotillo espresso drinking? here, Kim. Yeah. I can move mm -hmm. over this way and you'll be able yeah. to see it. It's in uh, Ooh, Mark Thompson's show mug that we... Of course it is. We, put it, we took a diner mug. We put one of the stickers on it, mm -hmm. which you can do yourself. You can put the stickers anywhere. Yeah, mm. that's high class right there. That's good. Ah, it's yeah. so delicious. So it really good. is. It's the best coffee I've ever tasted. Yeah. They are the official coffee, by the way, of the BNP tennis in Indian Wells. It's going on right now. In fact, Novak oh. Djokovic just lost down there. Kind of a big news out of the tennis world. But anyway, if you go there, I know very few people will, but mm -mm. there might be somebody who ends up in the desert, Southern Californians. They're in Indian Wells. Look for them. Coachella Valley Coffee. I'll bet this. I'll bet if you actually go and... If Cliff's there, you know, who is the roast master, mm -hmm. the roast master general is there. I'll bet if you mention our show, he'll hook you up and give you a free coffee. That's what I'm betting. I, I don't, I have no, we didn't talk about it. I don't know, but I'm guessing because well, so few of you will be there. I don't think it's. Uh, we're hooking you up with a 10% discount right that's now right. at this very exactly. moment. Yes. You got Mark T all together at checkout and you got your 10% off and you're good to go at CoachellaValleyCoffee.com. Right on. I'm Kim McAllister. This is The Mark Thompson Show. Mm-hmm. I'm loving it, Kim. They had to close down an entire radio station to silence him. It's true. And now he's here. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Thompson. With your iron hey, rod. It's George Santos mm. here. I come from regular stock. There's a reason that this place is fun. Don't ever use that word. It was great. I loved it. What are the porn stars doing, Mark? Don't talk to me that way. They pay me a lot of money for having attitude. What you say is the political dogma that they're trying to shove down our throats. Say that right in, no problem. That's not fake, that's real. What the hell is going on in the United States of America? Cuatro años más. A lot of people are telling me you're a liar. I don't wear a mask for the same reason I don't wear underwear. Things gotta breathe. Say what? Can you let him finish, sir? Do you have a secret talent? I love it when you're angry. You get nothing! Y'all can all go to hell, and I'm going back to Texas. All the time. Bye-bye. Did you really 
just be back. Right on, everybody. It is our Tuesday show. Great to have everyone. We're in Code uh, Lavender, apparently. Code Lavender here on our show. We have David K. Johnston, the great Pulitzer Prize winner, investigative reporter, best-selling author to come to our two. But right now, a guy who graces us regularly on our Tech Tuesdays, and he has today real news we can use and i could have used last night at the madonna concert how about it for the great jefferson graham and jefferson graham uh instrumental actually in helping us get the show up and running here on this platform but also in the lighting here uh in mark thompson land are you happy with it today sir i'm happy and I'd do anything for a poppy seed bagel and you know that you are beloved here for all the reasons that I just kind of mentioned and more, and also because Courtney loves that you love bagels, which we uh, have a big uh, store of here. Uh, and now, they are great. And they are great. Thank you. Last night, I was at this Madonna show, and I'm shooting, as many people are, I mean, it was hilarious. You just look across the crowd, and everybody's got their phone up. It's weird how we want to capture this for all time, even knowing that our recording of this is going to be crude and probably if you watch it at all, you'll watch it maybe once or somewhere between one and three times anyway, if but that. you still, it, it feels like the moment's escaping. You want it to, to capture it. So I run probably 15 minutes of video in total. And then I get the message. You've used up all your space on your phone. There is no more space for photos or videos. What do you do in that situation? How can you avoid that situation? Well, first of all, I always recommend checking your storage before you go to the concert, which you, which, and that's okay. But when you are in that situation, that rough situation, you open up your videos and you start deleting videos because that's what takes most of the space. Okay. Uh, uh, do, how are, do you have, I mean, what are we looking at on your phone? I mean, your video collection going back a long time. I mean, is there stuff that's needed? No, you're right. I think I can I can clean it up. But leave my specifics out. I'm kind of asking for everybody. Okay. Um, let's so, uh, let's yeah. look at a live iPhone right now. What do you okay. think about that? There's a live iPhone. All okay. Right. Now, the first thing you do before you go to the Madonna show is you go to general set in settings. General okay. and then here we go, iPhone storage. All right. And up it comes. And you could tell that I've used 331 gigs of 512. So I have a lot of room to get a lot of Madonna shots. Uh, and <laughs> okay. Had that said 500 gigs of 512, I'd be in trouble. And I would need to start deleting. Now, they have all these things in here like review large attachments and review your video. That doesn't really help you. Uh, but what does help is that you see that what am I using? 280 gigs of my 512 is is photos. And what that really means is their videos. Uh, I've got some apps on here that generate some stuff too, and you can delete apps, but it's it's the videos. And uh, let's see, let's review some videos here. Uh, unfortunately, these, these don't tell me how big they are, but you can tell, oh, actually they do, they do. Here's one that's 100 megabytes. And up at the top, what's that? That, here's one that's 1.2 gigs just there alone and is now when you get rid of it what happens yeah. to it is it gone forever or does it go to the cloud oh it's deleted it's deleted okay. so now you can't you can't at the madonna show miraculously upload all these clips to the cloud and save right. yourself when you have you know five seconds to move you're going to have yeah. to delete but the best thing is to Go over your storage before you go to the birthday okay, party. Okay, so let's assume it's now before the uh, the show. Yeah. Um, the uh, this is you know this is uh, how dare you, Chris? She is a cultural and pop music icon. How dare you troll my Madonna? If this was 1984 Madonna, it would be nice video. How dare you, Chris? Uh, but what I did want to point out is. Um, something related to the settings. And then I want to go to before you leave for the show or for any special experience. Mars says, Mark probably has the iPhone and does the highest quality HDR settings. So that uses 10 times the storage per minute of video. Um, let me ask you about the settings. And, and just yes. if you just want to capture something, you don't want it on the highest def. 
um, or, or whatever okay. you kids say. <laughs> what about that? Okay, F follow me. We're yes, going sir. to the, we, we're in the settings, and now we go to camera, the camera right. app. Record video. Uh, record it. If, you, if you're worried about space, record mm -hmm. it 1080p. If space okay. isn't an issue, record it 4K. But right. 1080p is going to look great. So okay, I, I think that I, I think Mars might be right. Mine might be too high a setting. Um, if gonna, you yeah. are, if you are on HDR, then I want you to take that off. Uh, right. It's uh, do I have it here? I don't remember which section it's in, but I I do not recommend recording in HDR. Uh, okay. It doesn't look that great, and the and the files are huge. Okay. Cool. Uh, and lastly, uh, on this issue. You said, well, you should take your videos and your photos off. You should you know, essentially clear the space before you leave. Okay, so I want to do that. Where does that, where does it go? How do, how, how do I offload it? Okay, well, first of all, there are many choices. You could use Apple iCloud. You could use Google Photos. You could use Amazon Photos. You can use Dropbox. You can use Microsoft OneDrive. You have several uh, things. I've got a... Uh, I've got a whole newsletter outlining all of it. I know, I've seen it. But what, okay. I, what, I, what I'm asking you, of, but I don't remember from the newsletter, is how functionally do I do it? I plug it into the computer or do, do I, is it a selection? Is it an app? Okay. How do you let me just, actually let me do just it? Tell, tell the viewers and listeners, I will tweet out that link so they can get it. Okay. Okay. But uh, yes, you would uh, basically click a button and upload stuff from your phone. And that that's, that's, that's it. So the button is associated with those options that you just described. When you uh, say click a button and you upload, yeah, well, I get the, it. But what button is that? Yeah, okay. So I spoke too fastly. Of course um, you did. That's I why I'm here to yes. redirect you. Thank I you. mean, my God. Do you know I, who I am? Exactly. I'm kind of a big deal. Right, I've never seen ahead. anything like it. iCloud is an automatic backup program. So you actually don't do anything. As long as you're online, this, your footage and your photos are being backed up. That's uh, how that works. Oh, so what, but, but, but how do I delete them from my phone but still have them in the cloud, I guess is what I'm asking. You don't because iCloud has this awful, awful setting that if you delete it from iCloud, you're also deleting Right, it I remember from that from one of your newsletters also. Right. So, uh, okay, I'm still then caught as to how, how it, so I don't want iCloud. I want that thing that used to, I don't know if they still uh, 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 underwrite your show or whatever, your sponsor, the old Smug sponsor. Mug. Mug. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a better deal, and it, it's unlimited, and they don't delete stuff. If it's only photos, Amazon Photos app, Mark, you should have, because they will let you upload everything for free, uh, and uh as but it's as videos. Remember, videos Prime. are what taking uh, videos. Yeah. When you say photos, you mean photos and videos, correct? No, Prime will take photos for free. They'll charge you for video. But it's the videos that are taking up all the space, not the That's photos. Right. That's right. Okay. Well, so photos, I need photos do take up space too. I get it, but, but not relative to the videos. Yeah. So I okay. would invest, Mark, in in whether that be Dropbox, Smug Mug, OneDrive, one of the services to upload your videos to that's not iCloud. Because that's iCloud what I wanted. Thank you, you. iCloud will drive you crazy. You think you're safe, and then you've deleted and stuff, you're not. and it's yeah. all gone. Thank you. That's what I wanted. Thank you. Um, sure. Jefferson Graham, you're, you're great. Uh, you have a lot of useful information. I uh, get your... Um, I subscribe to your Substack. I also watch your YouTube show. You. Uh, I have another minute here. What would you like to get to, please? Uh, I'm just going to say, please watch this weekend. I've got a Photo Walks TV episode about Oceanside, which is a San Diego beach community, un underdiscovered. It's one of my best ones, and I hope you help you check it out. Also, want to say the whole controversy over Kate, the the the. Uh, it's the princess of England and her doctored photo. This was great news for all of us who are concerned about AI and fake imagery. Uh, AP and Getty and Reuters rejected the photo when they realized that she had manipulated this picture of her with her kids. Wow. Wow. I, 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 we think something really big's going on there. We don't know, though. We think she's not there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Pretty crazy. Was that a good job of photoshopping or not really? I don't, you know, people are saying it was horrendous, but you really have to, you know, have your eyeglass out there to really see the bad stuff on the wrist 
and the clothing that the kids are wearing. Uh, I, you know, to the to the naked eye, it looks fine, but uh, if you want to really inspect it, then it it looks a little weird. And they have to know the palace does that it's going to be really inspected. After all, they are the royals. Uh, certainly, after this, they should know. <laughs> Find him through Photo Walks TV on YouTube. You will love it. Apparently, his latest episode, the one that's dropping this weekend, is one of his very best. He's very proud of it. So check him out. You can find him here on Tuesdays as well. He is the awesome Jefferson Graham. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Bye, buddy. The Mark Thompson Show. I like being told almost an hour into the show that my mic is a little hot. It's very good. It's a, uh, begging you for a more timely... Maybe I just didn't see it until now. No? Here it is, 11.43. Is it better now, Tony? Yeah, sounds great. I can't... I, I, I think it sounds great. I checked, it, it sounds okay right now. So, And yeah. I checked He's the got e a, extra feed. I'm running multiple feeds here right now. By the way, this right is now. something that we're working Everyone with. This is one of the most frustrating things, it. as you know, about, the, uh, about this platform, is that we need to actually go to the platform and listen in real time. And so that's what we're trying to do while also doing a lot of other stuff. And when I say we, Tony's basically running around doing all this stuff. So yeah. thank you, Tony. There's breaking news, apparently. Kim has it. And Kim, how are you? It's related to Hunter Biden. Uh, yeah, I thought this was really... right? Um, I, yes, this yeah. is correct. I thought this was really interesting. We're learning... The Mark Thompson Show. Go ahead. We're learning now that Republicans sent off this secret subpoena for a decade worth of Hunter Biden's phone records. This, uh, according to Jamie Raskin, who's a Democratic congressman out of Maryland, he revealed this AT&T subpoena in a staff memo to Democrats on the House Oversight Committee. Apparently, the chair of that committee, James Comer, who's a Republican from Kentucky, sent very quietly... Uh, this telecom giant, AT&T, a subpoena last week demanding more than 10 years of phone records related to President Joe Biden's son, Hunter. The March 6th subpoena, which has been obtained by um, the Huffington Post, gave AT&T two weeks to hand over all the records of user activity. That includes text and calls, logs for both of those, um, going back to 2011. And so the demand for the phone records issued as part of the Republicans' impeachment inquiry against the president. If they're, one wonders if they have to go back this far, what are they looking for? I mean, they're, are they grasping at straws? I saw a story recently that said there, there's clearly nothing for them as far as an impeachment inquiry into the president. So now the focus switches over and moves to criminal charges against Hunter Biden. That's their focus now. And so one would think that that fits with now the word that we have the subpoena for more than 10 years worth of phone records for Hunter Biden. Yeah, uh, maybe David will want to weigh in on this, but it's a, you know, at some point, it really does feel like a fishing expedition yeah. on a level that, you know, is, um, they're obviously trying to draw some link between the Burisma connection that obviously Hunter Biden did have. I mean, that's indisputable. And Joe Biden as vice president. But right. I, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll ask Debbie K. Johnston. So, mm -hmm. um, but thank you. That's just the breaking news of the moment. Yeah. Uh, all right, we continue. The Mark Thompson Show. Uh, this guy is a Pulitzer Prize winner, best-selling author. His work on and around Trump and the wealthy class and how they manipulate the system is some of the best in the field. He is with us on Tuesdays. He's the great David K. Johnston, everybody. Hi, David. Hello, Mark. Welcome from Miami Beach. All right. Look at you. Yeah. The uh, sun-drenched David K. Johnston. Um, David, uh, I don't know if you want to uh, quickly weigh in on that breaking news of the moment. It, literally, uh, Kim, you can pop back in. And essentially, um, James Comer sent out a, uh, a giant AT&T uh, subpoena last yeah. week uh, asking for more than a decade of phone records related to Joe Biden's son, Hunter. That's essentially it, right, Kim? Right. 10 years worth of records, texts and calls, wants the logs for Hunter Biden's phone since 2011. 
You know, there's an old saying among lawyers, when the facts are against you, argue the law. When the law is against you, argue the facts. And when you have neither, I would add, just issue subpoenas and see what you might get <laughs> in a fishing expedition. Yeah. So indeed, that's what it looks like we have here. You know, you've written and you've just written a new column related to something that you've spoken of uh, quite extensively on this show and elsewhere, and that is the money uh, that Donald Trump is on the hook for. Uh, you know that Donald Trump coffers better than anyone. You show the math in book after book, and you, among those things that you've shown, indicate that Donald Trump doesn't have the money to meet these bond requirements during his appeals. And already he's posted this $91 million bond. And where that money came from is really relevant. Yes, I have a piece which will go up very soon, hopefully in the next hour at msnbc.com or msn.com. Uh, and it's about this very point. Um, Donald, remember, nine years ago, told us repeatedly he was worth more than $10 billion. In fact, one time he said $11 billion. Uh, when he became president, he asked if he could file his um, required ethics disclosure statement that all federal officers have to file without signing under penalty of perjury. You know, if you file your tax return without signing it, you haven't filed your tax return. And so the Office of Government Ethics said, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Trump, you have to sign under penalty of perjury. Um, my analysis of his net worth, and I was being very generous at the time, was a little over a billion dollars. Forbes magazine, which has always given enormous value to the Trump brand, uh, valued his fortune a little over three million billion. Of course, neither of those is within 100 miles of more than $10 billion because Donald just makes this stuff up. And while we have very limited disclosures, we know that Trump claims that he has these enormously profitable golf courses in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Uh, under British law, he has to reveal revenues and costs and either profits or losses, and he just loses money hand over fist. Uh, and throughout his career, Donald has never been a wealth creator. He is a wealth extractor. Uh, had, had he just taken the $400 million or so he got from his dad and thrown it into the S&P 500 by buying Vanguard's uh, uh, index fund and withdrawn 1% or 2% a year, you know, he would be a multi-billionaire today. But that's not what he does. Money just runs through Donald's hands. And, and I would point out that based on Stormy Daniels' statement about their quote unquote affair, um, the payoff to her works out to be about $60 million a year for sex. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great fact that I have not heard anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, just, just take $135,000 by 47 seconds. I think that was her count. <laughs> Do the math. Um, the, 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 the deeper problem here, the one my article will go into in detail, and I don't want to go into too much here because it isn't published yet, <clears throat> is this. The framers of our Constitution, and remember, we live in the second American Republic. The first American Republic under the Articles of Confederation failed because it had no power to tax and no power to regulate business. So we overthrew that government in 1787 and got our constitution. And the framers of that constitution were incredibly deeply worried because they were pioneers in the idea that people could govern themselves about money influencing federal officials, especially the president. So we have the word emoluments appears in the constitution three times. The focus was on sources of income. So we don't want the states which are co-equal generally to the federal government, to be putting any money in the pocket of the president. And we don't want foreign governments doing so. Well, Donald Trump just flouted that left and right. Um, he A lot of money from state governments flowed into his businesses, um, and so did money from foreign entities. He claims he gave away the profits, but you know, there's no accounting or anything. It's just his word that he, he did this. What the founding, what the framers, who are not the same as the founders who wrote the Declaration, it was only about 20% were in both groups. What the framers of our Constitution focused on was income. It never occurred to them that they would need to think about a president who was in hock to an un-American or non-American, a non-American entity. 
Well, Chubb Insurance, which issued the $91.6 million bond, is a Zurich-based company. It has an American CEO, but it's a Swiss company. It owns three insurance companies in Russia. Uh, it may have other business connections with Russians uh, because of the oligarchs, the, the Putin's oligarchs, who are the biggest, best-funded criminal gang in the history of the world. They're all mul actual multi-billionaires. Um, and um, uh, the president of the, uh, well, the president of that company is an American. He comes from a family long involved in the insurance business and in many dealings that have drawn litigation the interests of securities regulators and others because of the way they run their businesses. They're very profitable, but I would not describe them as scrupulous in uh, the way they run their businesses. Now, there's a real national security nightmare here. Presumably, the bond that Trump needs to put up by Monday a week, uh, the 25th of March, uh, presumably that bond will also come from Chubb. It would be really complicated to have bonds from two different companies. Um, and that means that this entity will have more than a half billion dollar uh, leverage on Trump. It does business in Russia where you only can do business with the uh, permission uh, or implicit approval of Vladimir Putin, who is a murderous dictator. And this is really disturbing. Now, there's a um, the group Move On is still around. They are circulating a petition right now. <clears throat> they sent a copy of it to me today. I don't sign petitions unless they're about journalism. Uh, but uh, they sent a petition around demanding that no national security secrets be revealed to candidate Trump. It's been longstanding practice that if you're a candidate to be president, you get the same briefing the president gets. And I think that in this case is a really dangerous idea because we know that Trump has given away sources and methods. Who told us and how did we learn that to the Russians? We know that he's done that to an Australian businessman. We know that he's joked about it with the ghostwriter for a book by one of his compadres. Uh, Donald has no muffler on about what he knows, and what you have to keep secret. I mean, think about the fact that in 2011, at the gridiron dinner, that's this dumb uh, Washington White House press corps dinner they do every year, um, he made fun of Donald Trump. You know, he, he stood there and he, his joke writers had written for him, as they always do, his talk. And President Obama said, you know, I, I think about the weighty decisions that face Donald Trump. Should I fire meatloaf? And everybody in the room laughed the video shows except Donald Trump, who can't take a joke about himself. What we didn't know at the time was that was the night that they were executing the uh, uh, capture and ended up being assassination of Osama bin Laden. Uh, they had to delay it 24 hours because of some concerns that Obama had that he held back. But you wouldn't know that from watching his talk. He was, you know, he knew how to keep secrets. Joe Biden knows how to keep secrets. George W. Bush, Ronald Reagan, uh, Richard Nixon, they, they all knew how you keep these very important secrets. Not Donald. Donald has no, no mental barriers of any kind. If, if he thought it would, you know, get him sexual favors from some woman he fancies, you know, he, he'd given the nuclear codes away. I mean, and I mean that quite literally. <laughs> Uh, he, he is. He has no internal controls of any kind like this, and he has no conscience. He is an, uh, you know, he is an immoral man because he is fundamentally amoral. There is no right or wrong. There's only strategic self-interest, as in a feral animal that you know looks at its situation and decides whether to fight or flee and how to do it. Well, he even in his early meeting with the Russians at the White House, David, I think you had mentioned before, and you've detailed the ways that, you know, there were literally secrets that he let fly in that meeting. It was a private meeting he had uh, at, at that time. So you're suggesting essentially that in this way that Chubb, the company that posted the bond, has ties to Russia, it's a circuitous way, perhaps, not, not even that circuitous, like just a little bit roundabout, to suggest that... Trump then becomes beholden to another entity. It's the very 
situation that you described the the founders probably could never have envisioned or the framers could never have envisioned well, and, and the, the mere fact that he could be i mean i don't want to particularly cast aspersions on chubb but you know they do have business interests and we don't know as as uh, andrew weissman the former fbi general counsel has pointed out we don't know what arrangement is behind this bond i mean for all we know one of the oligarchs said i'll put up money to guarantee that the this will get paid at the end of the day which would be a disaster but, appearances matter and prospects of problems matter. And imagine for a second, if Joe Biden owed over $500 million to Chubb, what would you be hearing from James Comer running the committee investigating Hunter Biden? What would you be hearing from Mitch McConnell? What would you be hearing from Sean Hannity and from the former host Tucker? Carlson. And I think we all know, my God, impeach the man yesterday. This is unacceptable. Um, it is so odd, uh, David, to, to see the lopsided way in which this stuff plays out at, at the high. And I'm talking at the congressional level, you know. Yes. Uh, and then there's this, and this is sort of in keeping with that. Uh, Adam Schiff, you can see this is on the screen now, hoping that they dumb down Trump's briefings after his negligence with classified documents. This sort of relates to it in, uh, in the sense that uh, there is a briefing that continues to go on to, for former presidents. Can you speak to that a bit? A absolutely. Uh, the, the absolutely certain to be next junior senator from California, Adam Schiff, because uh, Steve Garvey has no chance of winning. That's why Schiff worked hard to get him enough votes to come in number two. And right. Order. Um, Adam Schiff made a perfectly reasonable observation. Donald doesn't know anything. Let's remember, he thought Finland was part of Russia. He didn't understand or know at all why there's a memorial over the USS Arizona when he arrived. And as a man who doesn't know Pearl Harbor Day, he, he uh, uh, perhaps it was just a gaffe, but he once talked about the British Air Force uh, during the War of 1812. Uh, 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 and and uh, Frederick Douglass being alive, uh, he's buried, buried quite close to my home and he died uh, 125 years ago. Um, Donald literally doesn't know anything. It's all a bluff. He didn't know the casino business when he was in it, which I originally found hard to believe until I interviewed him a number of times and realized he did, his executives were telling me the truth. He, he was completely lacking in knowledge. Everything is a bluff even though he claims to be the world's greatest expert on 22 subjects and to be the best expert of all history on taxes, a subject on which I am a world recognized expert. <laughs> and so Donald doesn't understand the things that are in the national security briefs. Um, uh, he, he wouldn't understand the issues, for example, between the leadership of the Kurds with the Turks, the Syrians, and the uh, uh, Iraqis. He, um, he wouldn't know a Sunni from a Shia. Now, I don't expect most Americans to understand the difference between Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims, but if you're the president of the United States, that's something you need to know extremely well. You need to know perhaps not as well as the back of your hand, but how about the palm of your hand? <laughs> you should and, certainly know that the, uh, uh, what countries are aligned with what yes. part of the uh, Shiite or... or, or uh, right. um, and, and in Faith. addition to all of this, remember that in Helsinki in 2018, Trump said he didn't trust the American, he said this publicly, he didn't trust the American intelligence agencies, but he took Vladimir Putin at his word because he was trustworthy, which all by itself ought to be enough to disqualify you from being president. Uh, and then he went and met with Putin with no one else in the room except Russians. So we have no idea what was said, what he did, uh, absolutely none. And the one time he did meet with a translator in criminal violation of federal law, he took the translator's notes away and tore them up. Those are government documents that belong to us. Uh, but Donald, who throws his, through, it's been his practice his whole life to, uh, at the end of the month, throw away, tear up and throw away his calendar. So there are no records. He doesn't use email because people on email, as federal prosecutors have taught me, 
they forget now and then. And then they write something that is incriminating, and that's how you get convictions. Well, and stuff can be recovered. Uh, you know, we, we know that the White House toilets were filled with all the uh, those torn up documents. I mean, destruction of documents seems to be kind of the coin of the realm. Yes. With uh, with uh, with Donald Trump, I want to double back to a little bit of what you were saying when uh, you talk about uh, perhaps a donor trail of some kind, or, or for uh, the company that posted the bond, but also the donor trail on the TikTok. Uh, reversal that Donald Trump ha yeah. has made. And Steve Bannon has actually suggested that Donald Trump has been bought. Uh, and it was an odd thing. He said it over the weekend. He said that his shift in his stance on TikTok, that is Trump's shift, he thinks is owing to some kind of relationship that may have, you know, persuaded him that TikTok should be hands off. Yeah, well, let's remember that uh, Steve Bannon, who is a young man, was a naval officer, is one of the prime architects of the Trump effort to, as he put it, deconstruct the administrative state, which is um, obtuse language for overthrow the government and make the president dictator. And I, I think Steve Bannon's comment deserves a weight, and we should think about it. I mean, Donald. Donald doesn't know national security. He doesn't know world history. He doesn't know tax or accounting or nuclear weapons or anything else he claims. What Donald knows is value. He's really good at that. He can look at a blank piece of land, look at the place, what's around it, and, re and recognize whether it's highly valuable, lightly valuable, or not worth his time. I mean, he's real good at that. You, you got to admire his skill at two things. Uh, as a con artist, he's the greatest con artist in the history of the world and at recognizing value. And when he flip-flopped on TikTok, I had the same thought Steve Bannon did. Gee, I wonder which Chinese interest is somehow putting money in his pocket, taking care of him. Maybe they're behind uh, Chubb's willingness to make this very risky loan. You know, a bond so that Trump can appeal the E. Jean Carroll's second defamation case without... Uh, having any of his property seized. That's a loan. That's a form of a loan made to Trump. A loan they have to pay off on when he loses his appeal, as he will. He, he might get some modest, moder, moder, modest reduction in the amount, but he will lose. There's no basis to overturn the judge's ruling. And when this happens again now, March 25th, as we expect, with the New York State Persistent Fraud Award, where he's got to put up more than $450 million. It's entirely possible that China is, uh, or a Chinese agent is in the background. And let's remember the Chinese agent infiltrated Mar-a-Lago, that the Republicans' uh, primary witnesses against Hunter Biden, one turned out to be a Russian agent, uh, but the other turned out to be a Chinese agent. And the FBI director, Christopher Wray, a Trump appointee who Biden has kept on, uh, has said in no uncertain terms that um, uh, uh, that the Russians have thousands of undercover agents operating in the U.S. and that counterintelligence officers keep bumping up against them. And, and people should know that, that in counterintelligence, you don't just go arrest people when you find out who they are. Once you know who they are, you want to watch them, you want to see who they're talking to, you want to see where the connections go. Uh, the, the object is not to get criminal convictions or get people thrown out of the country. It's to uh, understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, and most importantly, who they are doing it with. Wow. It's, I mean, it's a pretty bizarre picture. And just in that context, David, let me go back to this petition that's being circulated. So the former president does receive briefings. Uh, should those briefings, I mean, you can't modify them based on, or can you? I mean, well, sure uh, you can. no, no. I mean, the briefer has a lot of discretion about what he says and does. Uh, one thing they could do in the briefings is actually go the opposite direction of what Adam Schiff recommended. Put them in, in serious bureaucratic language, which Joe Biden or Barack Obama or Richard Nixon would get. I don't, I'm not so sure about George W. Bush. George H. W. Bush would get. But put it in such a, a deep bureaucratic language that it wouldn't mean anything. And, and use the classic abbreviations, you know, HUMINT, H-U-M-I-N-T. That's human intelligence, SIGINT, S-I-G-I-N-T. And, you know, I, I say all this as somebody who I've literally exposed spies and foreign agents. So 
well, this is not the core of my business. I have a good understanding of the principles that are involved here. I wonder uh, whether he would just push them on to, to, to others. You know, one of the, uh, you know, it, that seems to be his, uh, his basic, he has, it, it would seem based on all of your reporting and reporting that came out of the White House during his administration, he has such a, an ephemeral interest in everything. I mean, just like he, he'll, he'll stick with something for 15 seconds and move on to the next thing. Yep. Um, the Mar-a-Lago worker, our last couple of minutes here with David yeah. K. Johnston, who was the Trump employee number five. He's now come out of the shadows. And I thought his statements about how things were moved and how documents were going out as the FBI was coming in was both compelling and convincing. And in a weird way, David, he seemed to be an unwitting participant. Did you get that as well? Yeah, no, I, I think absolutely. He was simply, a, he's a functionary and he did the function he had and uh, uh, was reluctant at first because he didn't appreciate what was going on. But as it dawned on him what was happening, you know, he in fact proved to be a patriotic citizen, as opposed to all the people Donald has had signed non-disclosure agreements, paid them money to not be cooperative, Alan Weiselberg, his chief financial officer, just pled guilty to perjury during the civil fraud trial in New York, where Judge Ngoren makes it clear that with one exception, every single witness for the Trump side, including Trump and his three older sons and his daughter, two older sons and his daughter, uh, either was utterly incompetent and unqualified or lied. Every single one, because that's how Donald does business. You know, it's it, he, it's not like the way most of us live. It's like his marriages. All three of his marriages are transactional relationships. And I know some people have a very hard time understanding that. But, you know, there are people who get married for reasons that have nothing to do with love and romance. <laughs> um, uh, they have to do with, other, the, you know, other other matters. Anyway, I, I think that the the Democrats should be paying close attention to how much information is provided to Trump. And if he says anything that is out of school from these briefings, I think it's incumbent on Biden, whether he does it directly or through surrogates, to pounce on that and point out that Trump is not trustworthy. I would hit the document thing. As you know, I feel like this is the easiest case to understand, and we're not going to get it to, uh, to a court in time. But I just think it's so indefensible, so bizarre, so over the top, the thousands of documents in bathrooms and yeah. ballrooms and bedrooms. It's, it's absolute insanity. Uh, I, I wish there was more talk of that. I know I have to let you go. I so appreciate you being here. I will recommend your piece. It's in msn.com. It's, it, it's on the MSNBC website. Yeah, I don't know if it's up yet. When I went on the air, that we'd signed, I'd signed off on the edits. And so it's just a function of how long it takes them to post it. But uh, I, I, I would encourage people to read it because I think you'll have a good understanding of the dangers posed by a president being in debt and the loophole in our Constitution that, that never occurred to the framers. And the framers were very concerned. It's one thing I teach my students at Syracuse University College of Law is the framers were very concerned, not so much about individual acts of venality. That's always going to happen. They were concerned about institutionalizing and institutional corruption and uh, Trump is right critical to understanding that idea. And this is one of the areas where, you know, we need to seriously look at, at updating our 18th century e e constitution. We should open up the hood on a lot of things, maybe that among them. Uh, we'll, we'll look for that piece when it drops and we will connect it with a hot link under this video, everyone. Um, David, thank you. We look forward to Take Tuesdays. Care. Appreciate it. All right, David week. K. Johnson, everybody. See you next week. Bye. The Mark Thompson Show. Wow, he's so damn smart. So good. <laughs> I'm telling you, I could listen to that guy all day long. He's just terrific. Uh, I mean, you too, of course, Mark. Of course. <laughs> what? <laughs> listen to me. I don't want to hear you. Um. Yeah, I'm just looking at uh, various comments that are coming in. Um. Uh, we we got a. We've got our regular trollish people. I don't mind them at all. There was a controversy because I guess Kim banned someone the other day. What? No, I didn't. You I've didn't? Had, you? I haven't oh, banned somebody. In oh, a it while. wasn't you. It was it. Uh, it was John Daly. Who did? Who did it? Oh, you're talking about that Bert Tastic fellow. Yeah, he sent me a note.
That Should've, was a I, long time ago. Mm-hmm. Oh. He's been banned um, for a while. Yeah. Um Well, I um Oh, he's been banned for a while? Yeah. Months don't and you months. Th- don't you think it's time to let him back in? I mean, it's up to you. I don't well, you know, I'm not a big banner. I'm not quite the ban uh I don't have the trigger finger on the ban that everybody do- else does. This is a pre- pleasant place of harmony over here in the chat. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's like <laughs> I think it's a chat and the bigger, you know, wider the What do you think, Tony? Look, I only banned one dude cuz he was writing in all caps. Other than that. Oh, that <laughs> Tony yeah. was fine. It was That's all caps like, dude. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only reason why. Yeah. Uh I'm not for, I don't support bans. In general, I'm a non ban guy. You can, in fact, it includes well, call it, you know, calling me, you know, you don't know what you're talking about, Mark, whatever you want to say. It's fine. Say it. I'm confident in what I say. I am not affected by what you say. I do probably take criticism a little bit too much to heart. Sometimes mm-hmm. I respond to it maybe too aggressively, like, oh my God, this person just wrote in, they don't like the smash it with your iron rod <laughs> drop or something. And I come to Kim and I go, does that bother you, that that drop or whatever? But uh, apart from that, I'm not a big band guy. Yeah, I, uh, certainly, I, I don't want names called, like, I don't want, it, 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 Kim is different. I don't want you to call names to, at, at Kim or whatever, but yeah. I, I don't see a lot of that, but... Um, um, I like that Kim keeps yeah. uh, the chat safe. And what I really like, Roberta, is that Kim controls that comment and whether or not it gets on the screen. Yeah, that's the reason we just saw that comment. It's because Kim saw it and she wanted to support the argument. Okay, I very will good. I curtsy and take Kim, how credit. are you? Yes, uh-huh. I... Uh, there you go. Uh, but if somebody is name-calling, if somebody is racist, if somebody is saying things that are highly inappropriate, I will uh, you're, uh, give you a yellow card and then you're out. Well, and absolutely. If I mean, just somebody comes saying, here to stir some, up the pot. Yeah, goodbye. Sayonara. Yeah, I mean, racist, uh, anti-Semitic, yeah. whatever it is. I mean, any, all that yeah. hate stuff. Uh, we do not. Uh, we don't. We don't. We don't rock that. Uh, Sandy says uh, there is something seriously wrong if Trump is able to be reelected after trying to subvert an election and incite an insurrection. Something is wrong if he's still eligible to run. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, this just in, Sandy. Something is wrong. <laughs> okay. I mean, this country is in a new place. So. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, Kim, I have a special guest for Stories from the Sky. I can't tell you how excited I am about this. I have news. Mm-hmm. Um, if someone is trolling the chat, Mark, it makes it not fun, says Wes. Okay. Well, I mean, look, I, I don't really control the, ch- the chat. I try to check in on it when I can. But um, how would you like to? But anyway, thank you. And I and that's the latest. I But this guy did write an email and... Yeah, I wanted to see if you wanted to if revisit we want to his give situation. Him a, another opportunity, then I think that's fine. But if he if he comes back and he is just a general, you know, nuisance, then no. si- it's sayonara, sucker, one more time. Wow, it's very very tough. Do you put him through any kind of like uh, um, hearing process, Kim, where you no. uh, you and John Daly meet? And Have you ever no. been a member of the Chinese Communist Party? Yeah, it's you, a uh, unilateral yeah. decision at this point. All right. Well, there yeah. you go. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope it all works out. All right. The Mark Thompson Show. Now, uh, boy, I, Tony, I've had got some stuff. I had a nice chunk with David K. Johnson. I've got a really great guest on this Boeing situation in um, mm-hmm. Stories from the Sky. Kim, I ask you, uh, should we get to him or should we do some news and then get to him? Um, let's go ahead and get to him because I, there's a lot of stories that are very newsworthy that he'll be able to discuss. All right, very good. Then. Let's go. The Mark Thompson Show. Uh, there's a lot going on with the airlines and beyond. This is Stories from the Sky. We have clearance, Clarence. Roger, Roger. What's our vector, Victor? Enough is enough! I have had it with these monkey-fighting snakes on this Monday to Friday plane! Everybody strap in! An extraordinary guy. He helped bring EasyJet, which is the number one airline in Europe to Britain. He was the number three guy at EasyJet. Remarkable history in the aviation business, and I'm so honored to have him with us. Patrick Weil, everybody. Hi, Patrick. Hey, Mark. How are you today? I'm well. Thank you so very much. What a life you've had, sir, and uh, you continue (laughs) to have. Um, We are, we're so anxious to get first before we get to some of your background, which is really fascinating, to some of the stuff that 
is going on here? I mean, you've seen the aviation business because you really helped establish the business of EasyJet and the business of aviation across Europe and in this country as well, so active. Um, you've seen that business evolve. And I'm wondering, just as an overall first question, and then we can get into some specifics, if you've seen the business part of things, the dollar and cents part of things, now begin to outpace safety and production elements that are critical to sustaining safe aviation. Oh, is he there? Or can you hear him? Go ahead, Pat. Hello? There you are. I see you. Hi. Okay, go ahead. Uh, oh, well, the industry right now, it's, 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 it's an exploding dimension right now, right after COVID. So the airline industry obviously was shrunk and a lot of airplanes were parked in the desert and so forth. So being all that said, now everybody wants to travel, get out in the world, and the airlines are in a, I wouldn't say a panic, but they want to replace the business travel they lost during COVID. So uh, a lot of emphasis has been put on uh, leisure travel and uh, a, a lot of new markets and airplanes are now in places where they wouldn't normally have been previously, especially uh, uh, Southwest Airlines is in a lot of cities that normally they wouldn't have gone to, like Palm Springs or Montana, Bozeman, Montana, things like that, or Santa Barbara, for instance. So there's been this huge influx of leisure travel, and that has exponentially put a lot of pressure on the industry to uh, you know, hire pilots, um, and mechanics and that kind of and those kind of functions that um, need to facilitate the airline's operation. There have been revelations, Patrick Weil, that the process of building these planes is so flawed that there are literally parts being left out, new parts and uh, are being used in planes that are actually old parts that were discarded. This is what the whistleblower report indicated yeah. that there is essentially it's beyond incompetence it's almost a deliberate effort to just catch up with production i guess is what i would ask you is it that or is it well, uh, what's going yeah. on at boeing it seems like yeah. it, you know it's, manifest it's malfeasance and actually the uh the the, air, the uh, manufacturers boeing in particular decided to divest itself uh, from seattle because of union issues and they outsourced the production of the fuselages for 737s in particular to a company now called Spirit Aerosystems in Wichita, Kansas. And the factory basically was the uh, Boeing factory in Wichita. And they basically just outsourced the production of that to uh, minimize the uh, workforce in Seattle to put the final assembly of the department of Boeing to again bust the union i believe in, in, my, in my heart because i think that's where it all began and the um and then the failure of boeing to um uh, create another mid-sized jet to replace the 757 uh was one of the primary drivers and that created the uh, max 8 and the problem with the max 8 is that the engines were so large on it that it created an imbalance in the weight of the center gravity of the aircraft, which required a to off that. And that's where that's where the problems with the Max 8 became became apparent was that the air the, the airplane would try to fly itself as opposed to letting the pilots fly it. And that's what created the accidents, the first two. And then I had thought that perhaps after all that, that, that they would have cleaned up their act, and apparently they haven't. Well, as you say, that that problem, the physics of that, that then was played out with the loss of those two planes and the loss of those uh, beautiful souls, all of whom died, uh, you would have thought that would have brought something uh, about in this Boeing world that would have changed things. But it's actually just now one more thing that has been added to a long list of stuff that's going on at Boeing. In this blown door case, oh, yeah. there Absolutely. is the Boeing Max. Thank you for that uh, engine comparison. You can see it there. They yeah. they move that. It, it's it's just a slight move, right, Patrick Weil? But it's enough. Yeah, it creates this uh, imbalance, basically, right at the uh, little bit forward of the wing there. So it 
it the, the airplane can fly fine. It's just that it needs the computer to by, fly by wire, if you will, balance that that CG of the airplane out. And when it's heavy or it's taking off or, or going to altitude, that's usually where the, the problems of trimming the aircraft come into play. So that's pretty much what uh, was the problem in the programming of the computer system that was on the aircraft uh, was in conflict with the pilot's inputs to the aircraft. So that was, and, it, and you know, if you're flying an airplane, it just starts to do its own thing. And you, you can't, you have very little time to figure out what, how to fix it or correct it. And now the blown door, <laughs> Yeah, they're doing a, an investigation. Uh, the national transportation safety board is on that blown door that flew off the Alaska airlines flight. It was in a 737 MAX 9 jet. It was mid-flight when it happened. Yep. And it appeared to be missing four key bolts. So they're looking back at the assembly process. And they are hearing that key bolts are left out. They're seeing that key bolts are left out. And they're looking for documents that are related to the removal of this key part during production. Now, Boeing is saying... We don't have any documents. We can't find them. Uh, it's feeling, Patrick. I'm not asking you to, you know, uh, I, I, you know, to adjudicate this in this moment, but yeah. it, it sure smells bad. Well, yeah. If there's some, if there's smoke, there's usually fire, of course. And and what puzzles me in particular is that this didn't happen earlier with the same aircraft. So I was surprised that it, you know, it, it's a new aircraft. I think it had been about two or three months in service. Um, but I was I was kind of shocked now how that all came about because if, if the bolts were missing, then as soon as the aircraft pressurized, that door would pop right out. And that's usually where this happened. This happened around 16,000 feet, so the airplane was was pressurizing for a higher altitude, and that perhaps left a gap and that wide enough at that point still to to pop right out of the airplane, which is again astounding the fact that they did not have bolts to hold that door in place because that door is a non-operative door it's it was it's designed so in europe they have uh, different regulations for evacuation and that's the reason that door was created at all was was a uh, to to satisfy european regulators and it had really nothing to do with the u.s operation of the aircraft so it was it was deemed unnecessary however when airplanes sell, or they sell an aircraft after its lease, it, it may go to Europe or it may go to a, a, a third country somewhere, and that, that regulation may exist at that, for whatever that reason would be. Oh, that's interesting. I, did, I never even thought of that. That's an interesting uh, change in, in, in things. And, you know, into this mix comes a whistleblower, right? And the whistleblower okay. um, has every manner of damning evidence against Boeing, used to work at Boeing. He says that under pressure, workers have been deliberately fitting substandard parts to the aircraft on the production line. This is what I was mentioning kind of when we were first uh, starting this conversation. Um, he said that soon after starting work in South Carolina, he'd become concerned that the push to get new aircraft built meant that the assembly process was rushed and safety was compromised. Now, Boeing denies this, but he said that workers had failed to follow procedures that were intended to track components through the factory and that allowed these defective components to go missing and that in some cases substandard parts had been removed from scrap bins and fitted to planes that were being built to prevent delays on the production line all right this guy and it goes on and on and on the emergency oxygen systems um didn't work with a failure rate of 25%. So that, again, means one in four people on board that plane won't have oxygen should they need it in real life. Um, and he'd alerted managers to his concerns. No action was taken. So finally, he became a whistleblower. Now, what happened to him? He's found dead. He apparently took his own life. John Barnett had worked for Boeing for 32 years until his retirement in 2017, and he'd been giving all this evidence in this whistleblower lawsuit against Boeing. All of a sudden, he's dead from a self-inflicted wound. Uh, this just happened this week. Yeah, I know. Yeah, just a couple days ago. Yeah. Exactly. So this 62-year-old man who was trying to, I mean, again, as I see it, make a difference, right a lot of wrongs, um, 
who had worked, as I say, for 32 years for Boeing, he all of a sudden takes his own life right as he's as the suit is coming forward. Yeah, I don't that's know. It's quite ominous. I mean, uh, you know, now something like this happens here, nobody else may want to even come forward because, you know, the fear of, of not coming home for dinner kind of thing, you know, I, right. Maybe I can't, I can't really opine on it. The only thing I can say is that the major manufacturer Airbus too, as well, Boeing and Airbus are pretty much the, the one and twos left in the manufacturing world. But 90% of the parts of the aircraft are outsourced and their production rates are dependent on that, uh, supply chain still coming through. So that could be part of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. Right. It's not. And that's one of the things that you mentioned that, um, in a way, this process of putting the plane together involves several different locations and yeah. it's not just one, a production line. So it is all different. Has the effect of all of this news out of yeah, Boeing aircraft. What was that? <laughs> uh, did you see the uh, picture I sent you with the 737 barrels that went over the side of the hill and uh, Montana? Tony, do you have that? Do you have that? Off. Tony's got all of our stuff. Yeah, um, I sent that to you, but there was a, at least a half a dozen of the 737s that wound up in the riverbed from a train derailment. So my guess, and I haven't been able to fo follow that completely, is some of those airplanes are were, were picked up, salvaged, and put back into the uh, being manufactured so there's a real yeah, there, there they, they are, are. <laughs> yeah yep i think there was about there's three more that were uh that came off that train that was shit and it was a shipment between wichita kansas where the airplanes are being the barrels of the airplanes are being manufactured and that's again that's spirit aerosystems is a third party uh you know supplier to boeing but it, it, originally it was a boeing directly you know, uh, supervised factory. I suspect the biggest problem is hiring a lot of the uh, folks that work on these airplanes. There's probably some uh, inconsistencies and then the training and then the inspection of the final product is that every airplane that's built does have a qualified inspector that, that certifies that this is, you know, this is what we're doing. It's, it's, it's good to go. It seems like a lot of people will be on the hook here, and yet yeah. uh, I don't know what's happening at Boeing. It doesn't feel as though anything really big is happening. But um, again, I think this is an ongoing story. I want to just ask you in the last couple of minutes because you're such an interesting guy. Um, you, you know, you were born in California, and then yeah. you went into this uh, aviation world, and you got, um, you know. You fat. You started at the bottom. I mean, you weren't like hooked up I, with the aviation world, and yet you I ended started, up uh, started, at CEO level positions. Toilets on Air California, Burbank Airport. As a matter of fact, <laughs> and the toilets were never cleaner, Patrick Weil. Um, and yeah, then they, they were pretty clean, actually. In the during COVID, the airlines <laughs> did a good job of keeping them clean. <laughs> uh, I wish they would go then, back to that policy. I think that the airplanes were really nice. Yeah. Yeah, and, and then I did every job in the industry after that. Basically, I, I was uh, I was in charge of catering, and then I was in charge of the ground crews, and then uh, I eventually worked my way inside the terminal and worked at the ticket counter, and then the gates, and wound up being the manager, and then the ma and from there I wound up in the corporate office and sort of found my way. I never fixed them or fl flew them, but uh, I knew a little bit about everything. And that's what you need to be a CEO of an airline. It was uh, and, uh, really an impressive rise, you know. Um, it, and you're going to be a feature. I wish, <laughs> I wish gonna, there was uh, better money in it, but, uh, you know, we're working uh, on that, too. Yeah, you'll be a featured speaker. You admit you missed the big money. It's it's now just hit. I'll be uh, a featured speaker. You say at the airline CEO conference in Calgary in May. Yeah. So that's uh, yeah. that's pretty cool. And then I know yeah, that now invite, you're they invite me to speak every every year it's been uh, been a couple of a couple of sessions now but uh um I, because of the relationships i've built with some of these former ceos like bob crandall and uh and david nealman the, the creator of JetBlue, uh and they are very supportive of uh, i'm working on creating a tv series about the history of the airline industry that's never been done before and people really it, it really is a full 
expose of everything that goes on behind the scenes in the airlines. I mean, we were talking about the uh, United the tire falling off the United jet. Well, 90% of airplanes that come to the gate get their tires changed right there at the gate. They jack them up, they pull in a tire, put, take it off. And what I suspect happened there is that the tire was changed at its previous flight because it would have fell off during the previous flight. And, you know, lo and behold, somebody didn't put the, 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 uh, the uh, rivets back in the wheel. And that's exactly probably what happened. My, my take on that is that United probably needs to um, stop all their maintenance activities for a moment and reinvestigate every department in the maintenance area because something is, is falling through the cracks, especially there. And, uh, I mean, they had five incidents in five, six days. One was probably a pilot issue, but a lot of it was uh, mechanical uh, engine flame outs and they get blamed. Oh, there was a uh, what was styrofoam or something uh, in the, the got in the engine that caused a fire. Mm, I don't think so. It, it would be something much more substantial than that. Uh, a, a bird, you know, a big bird would probably cause a problem like that. That's what happened in the Hudson. And it's. Uh, it's interesting, though, that they always come out with a story that's BS, and oh, we have no background in yeah. aviation, and even on this show, we go, no, nah, we know that's not what happened, you know, that, but they always serve up some BS initially, but, um, yeah. but what a distinguished, uh, yeah. distinguished history you've had. That's the, um, that's the car that was hit by the, the tire that fell off of that jet isn't that right tony i think that's what that sort is sort of a jack yeah. of all trades a master yes. of none especially when yeah. <laughs> when it comes to when it comes yeah. to aviation Lucky you've done was, a, you've done a whole lot somebody they were you know they were, absolutely yeah. absolutely it's amazing um yeah the, and you were asking me about easy yeah. jet I, I hope you have time for that so yeah quickly because uh, we only have another minute so uh, of, okay in the dawn of um the internet a little airline I was involved with starting was called the Florida Shuttle, and it, we, we were the first airline in the world to use to use the internet as a as a way to distribute tickets and sell them. And because of that, it got attention from a gentleman named Stelia Sanaju, who is the chairman of the board of EasyJet, and he uh, he sent uh, sent away sent some tickets over to for us to consult them. And that's where it all started with EasyJet, and they they followed our our business plan right down to the letter. And they wow. how successful they are. Wow. Uh, here's one for you. In and out employees uh, got paid more a, than those workers was, for it, aircraft it was, maintenance. We, we, it was leading yeah. edge technology. <laughs> um, it's interesting. Do you think that um, compensation is a problem? People are suggesting that you know they don't pay those maintenance employees enough or whatever. Do you think that that was a problem here, or is it just a shoddy workmanship yeah, or? I think I think, no I think pride of ownership of, over the work yeah, you do. I mean, a lot of these, yeah, a lot of these jobs are union or not, and they, they're trying more and more to, you know, uh, send the work out to Costa Rica or some third country where there's no, uh, you know, union issues, and they, uh, it happens all the time in the industry. And uh, the problem I think is that there's not enough uh, maintenance uh, inspectors to to verify the work that's being performed, and that's a big part of it. I, I, I. Tr I can't really opine on Boeing's specific problems because they, you know it's uh, above my pay grade, I guess. Well, it's but also, I mean, I think it's super complicated, but you've kind of hinted yeah. at, a, at a few things here, so I, I love that. I hope you'll come back and visit us. I mean, we'd love sure to. Uh, clearly, the aviation yeah. world is getting beset by more and more problems, so it'd be really great to have you join us again, and you've been very generous. I know you're out there with the History of Aviation show. I wish you the best with that because that seems like a really solid television experience you know well we we have uh, attached william shatner as the host and uh, he's 93 years old but uh you know we also have uh, some other uh, interesting uh, folks we're trying to chat with right now uh, john travolta is one of them uh, and uh Dennis no that's Quay terrific another, so, yeah. there it is airlines uh, yeah, of the world hosted airlines by william shatner and yeah. we uh we just uh we're trying to sell it it's a, it's a hard sell because it's never been done before but uh and with William Shatner, we think we have the right uh, person in the in front of the camera for that. Well, he'll definitely get you a meeting. So, uh, all right, Patrick <laughs> Weil, thank you. Come join us again, will you please? I will indeed. Thanks, All right, Mark. Patrick Weil, everybody. Good stuff. Good stuff. The Mark Thompson Show. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. 
What a re- what a remarkable guy. He's done a whole lot. Uh, good stuff. Well, that's Stories from the Sky for today. This has been Stories from the Sky. The captain has turned off the seatbelt sign, and you are now free to move about the cabin. Uh, sad news came in over the uh, hours, the late hours. Last night, actually, uh, I was at Madonna's concert when I saw the advisory that Eric Carmen has died. Now, Eric Carmen was a brilliant singer and musician who led a band that I loved. I, I may, maybe one of my all-time favorite bands, and that is the Raspberries. And for the younger boys and girls, you may not know the Raspberries, but you should Google the Raspberries and listen to a few of their tracks. I think they're timeless. Google it. Yeah. Um, So I fell in love with the Raspberries. I didn't even know who Eric Carmen was. But then Eric Carmen broke from the Raspberries or, you know, went off for a solo career. And he did a song that you will know, and that is called All By Myself. Um, and he then did another song, Hungry Eyes. And I think those two songs sort of established him in the zeitgeist in ways that maybe the Raspberries did or didn't. I don't know. I like, you know, time passes and people forget who you are, but more to the point, um, he had his stuff covered by tons of artists. Um, Sean Cassidy covered his stuff. John Travolta covered his stuff. He began touring with Ringo Starr and the All-Star Band in 1989. And then the Raspberries reunited in 2004. And they turned it into an album. I haven't heard the album, which is amazing, after I've just kind of waxed on about how much I love the Raspberries. Um, They did a 28-song live album called Raspberries Pop Art Live. And the liner notes for that were apparently written by Cameron Crowe, uh, who, you know, uh, put Go All The Way, which was one of the um, tunes in uh, Raspberry's songbook, in Almost Famous. That was the um, Cameron Crowe movie. Anyway, um, I loved Eric Carmen. I thought he was immensely talented, and uh, clearly his... History in rock music and pop music is littered with examples of brilliance. Um, I can't play you any of these songs, as usual, because we'll be demonetized. And as it is, we're hanging by a thread on a lot of stuff. So all I can say is to, I think, a lot of people who may be um, of a vintage to remember Eric Carmen, maybe the Raspberries, maybe just him as a soloist, um, it's really a, it's a tough loss. And he wasn't an old man. No, he was I mean, only 74. Exactly. Uh, you know what else he sang? A song I really loved was Almost Paradise. Remember that? I can remember singing that one at the top of my lungs. The, I know the heart, didn't heart or Annie Wilson do that? It was, maybe it was paradise. the remake. Yeah, maybe it was the remake that I'm thinking of. I don't know. And hmm. also Never Gonna Fall in Love Again, he did. Yes, of course. That's a yeah. great song. Yeah. They don't give a reason for the cause of death at this time. They just say he passed away in his sleep at the age of 74. Yeah. Um, the um, He was married to a friend of mine. Oh. And he, I mean, up to his death. Uh, Amy Murphy is her name. She was a person I met in the news business. And then she left the news business and then she ended up marrying Eric Carmen. And I a- always thought, oh my God, you've married uh, my man crush. <laughs> I mean, I think Eric Carmen is just great. Um, so talented, you know? And, uh, but I never met him and never, uh, uh, I went, to, we, we exchanged text messages during one of the Ringo Starr shows, but Carmen wasn't playing that night with the, uh, there they are. There they are. I mean, again, she married the, in a way, you know, one of the great members of the rock and roll fraternity. And uh, 
it's a sad, sad loss, and I didn't want the show to end with at least um, uh, before I at least acknowledged mm -hmm. uh, the loss of this great artist. So Eric Carmen uh, passes away at 74. The Mark Thompson Show. Do I have anything else to do? The meetup is full. So that's done for Thursday. Doug Coke. What up with a super sticker, Doug? Big shout out. Big shout out. Thank you for the five spot. I think the audio levels are just beginning to get uh, flattened out here at the end of the show. That's what I, <laughs> that's my sense of it. Um, is there any other business that we have to do? Tony, do you know of any other business that we have to do? I think we're good. Yeah. All right. Got the uh, guests. Yeah, support the show. News. You know how to support the show, oh, everybody. Well, I that. don't know what to say. I don't know. I do my best. We try to get to everything. PayPal or Patreon is how we stay on the air. We should be up for the next uh, couple of weeks, I think. We'll, we'll last. <laughs> so, Kim is next over at uh, the After Party Live. We'll do it live! Yeah. I'll write it and we'll do it live! And uh, thank you guys for all the ways you support us. Really does help. Nice to know that every day when we come here, there are a bunch of you and that you spread the word please share our shorts share our videos across social media it matters it's how we grow the show through you so if you're on facebook share it on facebook if you're on all the stuff that you're on share it there share 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 thank you all right. thanks all and uh now without any further delay shadow i'm shadow stevens for the mark johnson show bye bye Kim, I'll come over and watch you. Out of time. Bye-bye. Okay. Till tomorrow, everyone. Thank you. And bye-bye.